everybody. Welcome to my Shalom Zone. My name is Sherry Dawn, and it is my great honor and privilege to get to share this grace encounter with you today. Now, I welcome subscribers, but whether you subscribe or not, I encourage you to please hit like and share to strike a blow for the kingdom of God. Bless somebody with some good news for a change. Decree with me. God is faithful, who will not... Allow me to be tested above what I am able to bear. Therefore, I will stand in His grace to outlast the test, and I will prevail. Amen. Yes, you will. All right. Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 4, one of the amazing keys in scripture that so many times gets overlooked. I praise God that that's rapidly changing. Romans 10 verse 1, the scripture says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Now the scripture tells us that my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, not for lack of power. And the problem with zeal without knowledge is that it always tends to become fanaticism and it does not produce holy fruit. In fact, it, it produces very legalistic, rigid mindsets that cause a lot of problems. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. So where is the knowledge lacking? He said they have zeal, but it's not according to knowledge. They're ignorant. So where is this ignorance working its ruin in their lives? They have ignorance of God's righteousness. They're going about to establish their own righteousness instead of submitting to the righteousness of God that is freely given as a gift based on what Jesus did at the cross. And verse 4 says, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Now, we must learn to emphasize this and to never let it go, to periodically go back and revisit this, look at this, feed on this, because Satan never quits challenging it. And humans, born again people, never quit challenging it. The righteousness of God is something to which we must submit. We cannot earn it. We cannot deserve it. We must receive it as a gift, and we must submit to all of the amazing things that it accomplishes and brings along with it. Now, why is this so important? Number one, we have to learn to recognize and embrace the truth that a shift happened at the cross. This is what it says. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. And number two, we have to remember that grace reigns through righteousness unto eternal life. And you'll find that in Romans chapter 5 and verse 21. If we do not submit to the righteousness of God, there's no avenue, no channel, no point of contact for grace to reign through and to change situations in this life. This is a problem because it is written that we're saved. Healed, delivered, rescued, protected, preserved, made whole. That's what that Greek word for saved is sozo, and that's what it, it means. It is an all-encompassing salvation. It does not, is not limited to the born-again experience. It means every day, everything that you need. We are saved by grace. So it's God's unearned, undeserved, unmerited favor that's going to do the saving for whatever situation that we need salvation worked in. And it comes about because of that grace, and the grace reigns through righteousness. It ha righteousness has to be the conduit for grace to flow through. Well, if we are resisting 
the righteousness of God and determined to go about establishing our own righteousness like the people under the old covenant did, the Pharisees that Paul's talking about here, then we're limiting the ability of God to get grace through in our lives. Not that it's impossible because he's God, he can do anything, but he has certain uh, guidelines and rules set up that govern his kingdom and he's not going to break his word. So the thing is that we are called to learn his word, learn his ways, and get in agreement with that. Now, grace is brought to us at the revelation of Jesus, according to the book of 1 Peter, chapter 1. So we don't want to be resisting the grace of God, and therefore we want to be learning to submit ourselves to righteousness because the grace reigns through that righteousness. Now, James chapter 4 and verse 7 tells us to submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Not just the preachers and the teachers and the evangelists. He will flee from you. But the first thing is submit yourself to God. Now, let me ask you something. How are we going to submit to God without submitting to His righteousness? We can't. And right here is where people get caught up in just rebuking the devil and rebuking the devil, but he doesn't run. He keeps forming weapons, and they keep prospering against them. And the believers get hurt, they get confused, they get angry, they start wanting to blame God. And still, some of them will keep hollering, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. But they forget the rest of that verse. And we want to go back and to be reminded of what the rest of that verse says. Isaiah 54, verse 17 says, No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Now, I've shared many times, Isaiah 53 is the picture of Jesus on the cross, the prophecy of Jesus on the cross. Isaiah 54 is the prophecy of the new covenant believer, the covenant of his kindness and his peace. And that kindness means the kaseed is the, the Hebrew word for grace. So this new covenant of grace and peace, Isaiah 54, 17, the last verse of Isaiah 54, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Why? It's because our righteousness is of the Lord. So this is speaking into the future, into the time when righteousness would be given us as a gift and it would not be something that we tried to earn or deserve by how well we were able to keep commandments because we couldn't keep them. I mean, that was the whole reason we needed a Savior. If you miss it in one point, if you break that law in just one place, you're guilty of it all. Well, we were guilty of it all. So we needed a savior. The devil is not scared of our righteousness based on our obedience to commandments, but he is terrified of God's righteousness that was given to us as a gift. Why? Well, it reminds him that he is judged. Psalm chapter 9 and verse 8 tells us that the Lord judges the world in righteousness. So any times he comes in contact with that righteousness, that reminds him he's judged and there's nothing that's going to undo that righteous judgment. He's got, he's got a destiny to deal with. In Psalm chapter 45, verses 6 and 7, I want to share this with you. It says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. This is speaking to Jesus prophetically. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore God, thy God, <clears throat> excuse me, has anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Now, I had never thought about this before, but as I was reading this and prepping for this uh, message, the Holy Spirit quickened to my heart. There's an anointing that's on righteousness. Well, we know from the scriptures in the book of Isaiah that the anointing removes burdens and destroys yokes. So this is another reason that Satan fears the righteousness of God because there's no anointing on self-righteousness, self-effort, 
righteousness by works. But there is an anointing on the righteousness that is given to us as a gift. And that anointing removes burdens and destroys yokes. Hmm, that's good news. Psalm chapter 50, verses 1 through 6. <clears throat> the mighty God, even the Lord, hath spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun unto the going down thereof. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God hath shined. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice, and the heavens shall declare his righteousness. For God is judge himself. Selah, or pause and think about that. So here we go with this picture again that the righteousness and the judgment of God and now it's going to be affecting the heavens. Well, see, the heavens is where, you know, the devil does his stuff in the second heavens. And he doesn't like the righteousness of God. So people that receive the righteousness of God as a gift and they submit to the righteousness of God as a gift and they understand that they're kings and priests, that that blood has made them righteous and they're walking in that righteousness and they're decreeing that righteousness, it affects everything that the enemy tries to do. So he does not love the righteousness of God. So he's always going to be trying to persuade you to let go of the righteousness by faith and to slip back into trying to work and earn and deserve right standing before God by how well you're able to keep commandments. Do not fall for that trap. Declare is from the Hebrew word nalgad, and it means to front, that is to stand boldly out opposite to manifest, to declare, and to expose. So, when it says that the heavens shall declare His righteousness, they're going to be declaring God's righteousness. They're going to be standing out opposite whatever the devil's trying to do. It's going to be manifesting the righteousness of God, declaring and exposing the righteousness of God. Well, see, the beauty about the force of righteousness is Isaiah 32, 17 tells us it works peace. It works shalom. It works wholeness and soundness and restoration. It works prosperity. It works tranquility. Well, all of that is totally against whatever the devil's trying to do. So, no, he doesn't love the righteousness of God. Psalm 97 Verses 1 through 7. The Lord reigneth. Let the earth rejoice. Let the multitude of isles be glad thereof. Clouds and darkness are round about him. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. See, our righteousness that we try to achieve through working hard and trying to be good, God's throne doesn't inhabit that. But now his righteousness that he's given us as a gift, his throne inhabits that. He's all over that. You have his attention. <laughs> you open your mouth and holler, Abba, Father. He, I mean, you've got his attention. And it doesn't take all day. It's right there. Do you understand? Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. He is ready to make decisions on your behalf and to back you up in what you're decreeing in this earth when you understand you've been made righteous with his righteousness. A fire goes before him and burns up his enemies round about. Now, don't you just love that picture of the fire of God just scorching those demons' hind ends that are false gods, fallen angels, and that are flitting through the air and terrorizing people and putting them under bondage. I love that picture, that the fire of God sets them on fire. His lightnings enlightened the world. The earth saw and trembled. The hills melted like wax at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. The heavens declare His righteousness, and all the people see His glory. So, here we go with this connection now between the righteousness of God and the glory of God becoming visible. No, the devil does not love the righteousness of God. 
He wants you to hang on to keep trying to establish your own righteousness. But oh, there's a generation that's waking up right now that they're not having any more of that. And they're determined they're going to stand in the righteousness of God and keep declaring His righteousness for sins that are past. Woohoo! Confounded be all they that serve graven images that boast themselves of idols. Worship Him, all ye gods. Well, now remember, those gods with the little g, those are fallen angels. Well, they can't worship Him. They can't repent. But He's pointing out here, this throne being established in righteousness and the heavens declaring His righteousness and the people seeing His glory... It's going to bring about confusion on people who are all caught up in worshiping these fallen angels and their images. This is spiritual warfare at its maximum highest. And all you've got to do is submit to being the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Isn't that hard? It's one of the hardest, easy things you'll ever do. <laughs> one of the easiest, hard things you'll ever do. Oh, my goodness. The righteousness of God impacts the heavens where the principalities and the powers have been bearing rule, and they don't like it. And the scripture tells us that in the last days, the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Well, I've ministered on this broadcast, you know, in, in previous broadcasts. This is where we are. Everything is being shaken so that the things that can be shaken can be removed. Hebrews chapter 12. This is where we are. <coughs> Excuse me. Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 2 tells us that righteousness delivers from death, the living force of God's righteousness flowing through us, it delivers from death. That's the reason believers can lay hands on the sick and then recover. That's the reason that they can speak into situations and reverse those situations. But faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We have to hear this. We have to understand this so we can operate in this. And that's the reason God's raising up ministers that are sharing these truths with people so they can get a handle on it and start operating in it. Because there is a generation of people that is perishing and it needs salvation. And God's heart is to save nations. And he does that by forgiving their sins and giving them this precious gift of his own righteousness. Oh, good gracious. Grace reigning through righteousness of God undoes all that the enemy has been trying to accomplish through sin and death. As I said, Isaiah 32, 17 tells us that the work of righteousness is that shalom peace. In Romans 9 and verse 28, the scripture tells us that the work is finished and cut short in righteousness, not our self-righteousness, but that righteousness, which is a gift from God. Now, that's also a problem for the enemy because he does not want to be booted off the planet. So he's trying very hard to keep people from submitting to the righteousness of God and keep them deceived into trying to establish their own righteousness. We've got to understand, receiving the gift of righteousness is an act of submission. And when we submit to God, and that's one of the things that we're submitting and doing is receiving his righteousness. Then when we resist the devil, he flees from us. People who receive the gift of righteousness reach a place where they cannot be manipulated by guilt and condemnation. And that makes them bold. Satan does not like bold righteousness because it confronts him without apology or remorse. Righteousness, that living force that works shalom, it causes the righteous to inherit the land. Well, he does not want the righteous to inherit the land because when they do, they're going to see things are done the kingdom way. And that's against everything he's trying to do. So he tries to stop that. That's what the warfare is all about. You'll find that in Psalm 37, verse 29. <clears throat> Excuse me, righteousness, that living force that causes the righteous to flourish like the palm tree and to bring forth fruit even in their old age. Psalm 92 and verse 12. I love it because when people get a little age on them and they get a little wisdom under their belt and then they find out I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus and because of that I flourish no matter what my age is. Oh my goodness, you got some energy and strength to go along with that wisdom. 
and it's just not good for the devil or his plans or his cohorts or anything. Well, God's raising up just such a generation right now. Righteousness is the living force that causes the righteous to be out of, delivered out of trouble. Proverbs 11 and verse 8. No matter what kind of trouble that the devil stirs up, the destiny of the righteous is to be delivered out of it. He didn't say we would avoid trouble. He said we'd be delivered out of it. That means when the people get in trouble, Satan brings the trouble against them, they're going to begin opening their mouths and declaring the righteousness of God. They're going to be declaring the covenant of grace and peace. They're going to be declaring what the blood of Jesus has done for them. They're going to be receiving communion. And guess what? They're going to walk right out of it. And that includes the great trouble, <clears throat> excuse me, the great tribulation of the last days. So, you know, don't let that stuff throw you. The things that God has given us are greater than anything that the enemy has got planned or that he can orchestrate and turn loose in this earth. Righteousness is the living force that puts the righteous in authority and causes the people to rejoice. Proverbs 29 and verse 2. See, when Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me, now you go, preach the gospel to every creature, make disciples of nations. He's also the righteousness of God. The scripture says we've been made the righteousness of God. Where? In Christ Jesus. <laughs> oh, goodness. So do you see when you're seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, you're just seeking Jesus. Fresh revelation of Jesus, more of Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Righteousness is the living force that puts the righteous in authority. And when the righteous enter in authority, the scripture says the people rejoice. Glory to God. Well, now this is also problematic for the devil. Because when people rejoice and praise God, the scripture says in Psalm chapter 8 and verse 2, it stops the enemy. I love that picture. Psalm 8 and verse 2 says that God has ordained strength to stop the enemy. In Matthew 21 and verse 6, Jesus quoting this scripture said he has ordained praise to stop the enemy. So you need to understand that that praise and that strength is the same thing. There is a strength that comes forth when you lift your voice in praise and in worship and in singing unto the Lord, even in the middle of the mess, especially in the middle of the mess. And that causes Mr. Defeated to lose again. <laughs> and I like that knowledge. Let me bless you. As a priest of the Lord Most High, I bless you in Jesus' name. The Lord give you favor according to the riches of His grace. The Lord restore health unto you and cause you to prosper. The Lord bless you and your family with both protection and peace. The Lord quicken you all according to his word and grant you revelation of his righteousness that you may triumph and prevail in these days. May you live to be 120. I hope you said amen. Let us pray. Father, we praise you for your righteousness. And right here and right now, we declare out of our mouths, we submit to your righteousness. And we let go of this dogged determination to slide back into trying to establish our own righteousness so that we can feel confident enough to ask for your help. Nope. We come to you based on the strength of Jesus' righteousness, the fact that you gave us that righteousness in him. For he was made sin with our sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We celebrate that truth, Lord. We praise you because as the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, the scripture is fulfilled. It says, blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Blessed is that man because his sins are already covered. His iniquities are forgiven and the Lord will not impute sin to him. That's us. And Lord, we thank you for that. We praise you for that. And we're asking now on behalf of every member of the body of Christ that you wake us up to what it means to be the righteousness of God and help us to understand that it is a living force and that grace reigns through it and that all of the good that you've got ordained for this generation and to break forth into this earth as you make all things new and as you rebuild and restore, it hinges on that revelation that we've been made righteous with your righteousness as a gift, and it was freely given. Lord, we freely receive it, and we pray for all the body that they receive wisdom and revelation in how to submit 
to that righteousness. We receive it done in Jesus' name, and we just thank you, Lord. All glory and dominion be unto you. Amen. Well, alrighty, dear friend. I hope you have an absolutely wonderful day, and I will talk to you later.